My name is Dwight Hendrickson, and uh, Alan Bailey invited a response to his YouTube video on marriage, divorce, and uh, remarriage. My first response is to one of his personal preferences. A second thing is very important. This is a personal choice of mine. And I've had brethren say, I don't like that. I said, well, don't do it. I'm going to do it. And that is, I don't usually perform weddings who of somebody who's been divorced and going to remarry, even if I think it's a scripture. That's one. nice, Alan, but uh, why do you teach questionable divorce? Write doctors? this down. Mark 10 is the only case and the only biblical example we have of a woman divorcing her husband. And in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. How does Alan uh, get the woman the right to divorce in Mark 10 and 12 when uh, she is actually denied the right to divorce? Well, I believe that Alan has given her the implied right that he believes is found in Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19 and 9. Since Alan uh, basically believes that the woman is equal to the man in divorce rights, then uh, he believes she has the implied right. But is this true? Ellen uh, missed the Jewish concept of agona. Agona, Hebrew, plural, agonot, literally, anchored or chained, is a halakhic term for a Jewish woman who is chained to her marriage. The classic case of this is a man who has left on a journey and has not returned, or has gone into battle and is missing in action. It is used a borrowed term to refer to a woman whose husband refuses or is unable to grant her a divorce document in Jewish religious law known as a get. For a divorce to be effective, Jewish law requires that a man grant his wife a get of his own free will. Without a get, no new marriage will be recognized, and any child she might have with another man will be considered a mamzer. I want to uh, cite an historical example of a woman violating agona. Josephus, the first century historian, said about Herodias, Herodias took upon her to confound the laws of our country and divorced herself from her husband while he was alive and was married to Herod Antipas. Josephus was a Pharisee after trying several Jewish sects in the uh, first century, and he was very liberal on divorce. He had uh, three or four wives, and he divorced one of them simply because she displeased him. So I don't think that Josephus would have objected to Herodias putting away Philip for any reason, but he did object to the idea that Herodias confounded the laws of our country by initiating the divorce. And that's why he cited this as an example of a woman who violated agona. Alan uh, thinks Jesus taught against the Old Testament. Therefore, he considers the contrast Jesus presented. Matthew 5, Matthew. 31 and 32. Now look at this phrase. Look for it. It hath been said, but I say unto you. Several times in Matthew 5, you're going to see, It hath been said, but I say unto you. Now I will go ahead and tell you right now. There's a strong difference of opinion on what that contrast means. It hath been said, but I say unto you. Some believe it hath been said, that they perverted teaching of the Mosaic law. 
But I say unto you, is it true and actual teaching of the Mosaic law? Guess what? That is wrong. And I know people are going to see this on YouTube who are just going to be all over me and want to call me. Call me. That's wrong. It hath been said as part of the law of Moses. But I say unto you, it's the law of Christ. That's what it is. And we'll be able to support it a little bit tonight, but a lot more in further discussion on this particular chapter. So when you read, it hath been said, it's the teaching of the Mosaical law. In contrast to, but I say unto you, the law of Christ is this coming. Okay, I know you're thinking, all you Bible students are thinking, how could Jesus be preaching his law while he was alive? He had been violating the Mosaical law by teaching another law. That's a good question. Now you want a good answer? The good answer that I have to use in debates is Jesus was preaching the new law, but he wasn't binding the new law. Write it down. Jesus preached the new law when he said, but I say unto you, but he did not bind the new law. All right, you're at Matthew 5, back up one chapter to Matthew the fourth chapter. Look with me at verse 23. Let's see what was being preached. Verse 23 of Matthew 4, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. What was Jesus preaching? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he was preaching right here in Matthew chapter 5. When he said, it has been, I say unto you, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He wasn't binding it yet. Let me ask you, if Jesus did not make his will, his covenant, his testament while he's alive, would you please pray tell me when he made it? You know what Hebrew 9 and 16 says? A testament is a force after men are dead. You had to make your will while you're alive. You made your will while you're alive. When you die, that will is executed. <laughs> Jesus made his will while he was alive. When he died on the on Calvary, the old law was taken away, nailed to the cross, the new law came into effect. The other day, we can go into much more on that. Now, we have Matthew 5, 31, 32. We've read this. It's very, very clear. And then we're going to connect it with a couple of more passages and then go straight into Matthew 19. So let's go back to Matthew 5, 31, 32. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That is precisely what Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 teaches. I'm not going to turn over there and read it. Time is running away with me here. And I've got to speed her up a little bit. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, it lets me be known. If you marry a woman, you find some uncleanness in her, put a rod in divorcement in her hand, send her out of your house. Guess what? This is what Matthew 5, 31 says. Give her writing of divorcement. Right beside that, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, look it up on your own timetable. The next verse said, but I say unto you, Jesus said, now what you've been hearing and the way it used to be under the Mosaic law was you give a right of divorcement, send it out of your house. But I'll tell you the way it's going to be. But I say unto you, whosoever should put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, whosoever should marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Listen, if you marry anybody, anybody in the church at all that was divorced for any reason other than fornication, you are unscripturally married. Understand that. You can't twist it. You can't turn it. You can't make it sound any different, any better. You don't want to face God in that situation. That's a good way not to win friends and influence people, I'll assure you. I'm telling you what it is to make it where you can go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven living in adultery. You can't do it. You marry, you marry for life. If your spouse commits immorality, you can divorce her. If your husband commits immorality, you can divorce him. But that is the only reason Jesus gave why you can divorce your spouse and remarry. The only reason Jesus gave is for immorality, fornication. From the Greek word pornelia, which is where we get the word pornography from. And on and on, another day, another dollar of discussion even on that. I want to show you something. Just to show you 
that it is not a perverted teaching of the Mosaic law, okay? Let's just back up to the previous, it has been said, but I'll say unto you. Just back up to verse 27. I told you there were several of them here. Let's just back up the one before it. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, that is part of the Ten Commandments. That's found in Exodus 20 and verse 14. You know what it said there? Thou shalt not commit adultery. What did this say? You've heard it hath been said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know what that meant? Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's exactly what that meant. That is exactly what the Mosaic Law taught. Don't you ever allow yourself or anybody else out here at YouTube land to understand that to be anything different than it has been said is the true and actual teaching of the Mosaic Law. That's what that is. It's a contrast to the upcoming law of Christ. That's what we learn from right here in this passage. Much more I can say, but let's go to Matthew 19. There are many scriptures that, that give us the context of the contrast Jesus presented in Matthew, the fifth chapter. And I don't even think the scripture that Alan backed up to in Matthew 4.23 gives him the kind of context that he really wants. I will explain that in just a minute. I'm sure Alan is familiar familiar with the overall framework of the Gospels which Jesus preached but I still want to mention Galatians 4 4 because I think that's a very important scripture concerning this framework Galatians 4 and 4 says but when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law we all know what that means it means Jesus was not above the law. Uh, Jesus couldn't just say anything he wanted to say or do anything he wanted to do because it had to be lawful. And Jesus was under that law just as long as he was alive, according to Romans 7. Jesus was neither an elitist nor a politician. He didn't operate by a double standard like many people do today. And that's why he had a lot of powerful enemies. He didn't expect the uh, common people to live one way while he lived another. In fact, Hebrews 5 and 8 tells us, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. That uh, was his mission on earth, to be obedient, and he expects obedience from us. 1 Peter 2 and 22 says, He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now I want to back up to a scripture just a little further than Alan did to Matthew 4 4 where Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness and we all know how Jesus resisted Satan in the wilderness he quoted from Deuteronomy he said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God does uh, Alan suppose that Jesus really meant that? I wonder sometimes. I believe that Jesus meant that more than any man alive. He uh, was able to live by the law perfectly without sin. And yet Alan is accusing Jesus of teaching against the law by which he lived. Jesus supposedly lived by the law in his temptation and then he taught against the law in the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't make sense to me. I believe it makes Jesus a hypocrite. I'm very pleased, actually, that Alan left off a very important expression in his whiteboard. I, I noticed it right away, and it gives me the opportunity to emphasize that which I believe Alan has failed to emphasize. So I want to emphasize it all I can. Well, what did Alan forget? He forgot that Jesus said, You have heard that it hath been said. Alan shouldn't have forgotten that expression because it's very important. All the expressions Jesus used were very important. Jesus wasn't talking just to hear himself talk. When Jesus used expressions like, Have you not read? 
What is written in the law? How readest thou? It is written, like we're studying today in this uh, Matthew 4. And what did Moses command you? He meant no disrespect at all. He respected all of the law of Moses. However, when Jesus used the expression, you have heard, he was actually opposed to some of the things which they had heard. He even taught against those things which they had heard. They couldn't even enter into the kingdom of heaven if they listened to what they had heard in the synagogues from the Pharisees. So Alan and I have a basic disagreement. Alan believes that Jesus had a problem with the law of Moses, and I believe that Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees, and I think I can prove that. For example, we want to notice Matthew, Matthew the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 3. In Matthew 15, verses 1 through 3, it says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, their oral tradition? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Jesus had a problem with their traditions. He didn't have a problem with the commandment of God. He had a problem with the Pharisees. And that's the basic difference between myself and Alan. Before I uh, get into a very important preface to the contrast in uh, Matthew, the fifth chapter, I want to go back to Matthew 4, verse 17 and 23 where Alan believes that uh, the gospel Jesus preached proves that he taught against the law of Moses. Uh, this is not true because Jesus taught a gospel that Alan in no wise can preach. Why can't Alan preach the gospel that Jesus and John preached? Let me notice Matthew 4, 17. From that time, uh, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There are two reasons that Alan cannot preach the gospel that Jesus preached. First of all, he cannot preach repentance like Jesus preached it. Well, why is that? Romans 4 and 15 says, Because the law worketh wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Alan said Jesus taught the gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, but he bounded on them later. Well, how could uh, Jesus teach repentance to a gospel that was not even existing yet? I intend to show that Jesus bound what he taught immediately on his audience. Second, Jesus taught the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I know that Alan believes the kingdom of heaven exists. It's a spiritual kingdom that is existing here and now. Alan believes that kingdom came on the day of Pentecost in the Acts, the second chapter. I'm uh, sure he quotes sometimes uh, Colossians 1 and 13, delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I don't believe Alan preaches the eminence of the kingdom, uh, but Jesus taught the eminence of the kingdom. Alan also stretches an analogy. He gives the analogy of a per person writing their last will and testament before they die, and then that uh, testament becomes effective after they die. By stretching this analogy, Alan actually contradicts the scriptures. Uh, Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter used these keys in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. In John 16, verses 12 through 14, 
Jesus told his disciples, I have met yet many things to say to you, but ye cannot bear them now. Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Well, when did Jesus send the Spirit to the disciples? We know it came in Acts the second chapter, verse 1, the day of Pentecost, where the disciples were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, this also reminds me of analogy, uh, an analogy that George Batty has been presenting lately. Uh, his, his analogy, which he stretches, also contradicts the scriptures. He compares uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount with Moses going up on the mountain to uh, receive the law. And just as Moses came down from the mountain to give the law to the people, Jesus gave his law, the law of Christ, in the Sermon on the Mount. But this mountain in Galilee was not even prophesied as the place where the law would go forth. In Isaiah, the second chapter, verses 2 through 3, uh, it was prophesied, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus told his disciples in Luke 24, 46 through 49, after he was resurrected from the dead, after he had spent some time on this earth in a resurrected uh, f form of some kind, he told his disciples, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, his authority, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And uh, ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Just like uh, Mark 9 and 1 states that there were many standing there that would not taste of death until they had see the, seen the kingdom of heaven or God come with power. So George uh, stretches an analogy. He got the wrong time. He got the wrong place. And uh, he has the wrong idea about this uh, Sermon on the Mount in the uh, mountain that was in Gal Galilee. Uh, now let me go to uh, the very important preface to the contrast in Matthew 5, verses uh, 17 through 20. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Glenn Eastwood famously said, A man has got to know his limitations. I believe Jesus knew his limitations. And I believe that he also let his audience know the constraints under which he operated. 
But Alan doesn't seem to know these constraints. He didn't cover it. In fact, I believe that Alan is thinking exactly what Jesus told the Jews not to think. Jesus had not come to destroy the law and the prophets. He had not, as Alan said, come to teach a gospel and then bind it later after the cross in the contrast. There is no such anachronism. The difference between my approach and Alan's approach can be summarized as follows. Alan believes that uh, Jesus taught the gospel, but I say unto you, against the commandments of God it hath been said. But Dwight believes that Jesus taught the commandments of God, but I say unto you, against the tradition of the Pharisees you have heard that it hath been said. I may uh, be a little greater than Alan in the kingdom of heaven because at least I understand that Jesus came to do and to teach the law as well as to preach the gospel. At least I'm not indirectly accusing Jesus of being least in the kingdom of heaven. The last part of Jesus' preface in Matthew 5.20 allows us to understand why Jesus was giving the Jews his contrast in the first place. He said in verse 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't say, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness found in the law, like Alan says. He said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Then Alan goes to Matthew 5, 31 through 32 and tells us that verse 31 is exactly the law. No, Alan, verse 31 teaches no fault divorce just like the school of Hillel, a Pharisee. Alan has really aligned himself with the school of Hillel when he says that uh, Hillel is the Old Testament. Verse 32 gives us divorce for just one reason, that is fornication. The school of Shimei taught divorce for unchastity. Jesus similarly taught divorce for fornication. One reason I'd like to notice this debate between Hillel and Shimei in the Mishnah. In Gittin 9 and 10, Gittin is the plural for a get, the house of Shimei thought the man only had one grounds for divorce and that was unchastity. Hillel thought she had many grounds even if she spoiled a dish. Our Aqaba thought many grounds as well, even if he found someone prettier than his current wife. And this was all based upon Deuteronomy 24 and 1. Before we uh, go on to Matthew 19, I want to make some comments about Allen's interpretation of Matthew 5, 27 through 29. Alan uh, was certain that Jesus was contrasting the gospel with the seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, but I believe he was merely reminding them of the tenth commandment, which said they shouldn't covet, among other things, their uh, neighbor's wife. Why would Jesus do this? Well, we know that lust leads to adultery, and Jesus was trying to nip that sin in the bud. Since the Pharisees always seemed to emphasize the outward act instead of the inward act, 
Jesus emphasized the inward act. That's why Jesus referred to them on occasion as whited sepulchers. Let's go to Matthew 19. Now with the preliminaries that we have laid forth, Matthew 19, 1 through 12, is going to be rather easy to cover. So here we go. Be with me. Follow me carefully. If you have any questions, write it down, and we will take off, uh, and we will be glad to answer that after we dismiss this evening. It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came to the coast beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. This gives the backdrop of where Jesus was when he was preaching, etc. They were tempting him, trying to get him to make a blunder. All right, verse 3. Very important thing in verse 3. Many religious people today in the church, brothers and sisters, good men and good women, they hear the question. They want to know where was it answered. Verse 3, look at it now. Verse 3 said, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? I'm sorry, back up verse 3. The Pharisees came unto him, tempted him, and said unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Every cause. Can a man put away his wife for every cause? Jesus. Now, how do you think Jesus answered that? This is huge. They tempted him. They tried to get him to falter here. They tried to get him to fall away, to answer and out misfeet. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You know why they asked that, don't you? They were accustomed to putting away their wife for every cause. Multiple divorces in the Mosaic Law. Many divorces. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, we mentioned earlier, he gave two causes right there. So now Jesus had the task of answering that question. And I want to show you how he answered it. This may be new to you, but it's been in the Bible the whole time. All right, let's look at verse 4. Jesus answered and said, Have you not read that he who made you at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, they shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore, there are no more twain but one flesh. While therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You can read back in Moses, back in the Patriarchal Law in Genesis 2 and 24. Jesus said from the beginning, you know, the beginning was the Patriarchal Law. The days of Adam and Eve and forward. For hundreds of years. Jesus said from the beginning it was not so. You could not divorce your spouse for every cause. Well, you know what they did? They popped up with verse 7. And in verse 7, they said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a right of divorcement and to put her away? Write it down again, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. That's precisely what the Mosaic Law said. Just like in Matthew 5, that's what has been said. You give a right of divorcement, put it in her hand, and send her out of your house. Now what's Jesus going to say? Oh, he answered it. Look at it again with me now, verse 8. Jesus said, Moses... Because of the hardness of your hearts suffered you to put away your wife. But from the beginning it was not so. Now Jesus said it this way. I tell you what guys, here's the way it is. Moses, because of your hard hearts, he allowed you to do that. But from the patriarchal law, it wasn't that way. Moses and the Mosaic law, he allowed it because of your hard heartedness. And then in verse 9... Here it is, verse 9. Jesus said, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her, doth from put away, doth commit adultery. There is my proof for if you marry someone who had no scripture right to remarry, you've committed adultery even if it was your first, first marriage. You cannot marry somebody divorced. That's why Alan's just scared to marry somebody who's been divorced. I'm afraid they polish her story, made it sound better than it is. Don't marry somebody who's been divorced. I want to tell a lot of people, just for your own soul salvation, only from Alan. The Bible allows you to Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. You can marry anybody who's been scripturally divorced like that, or marry that has scripturally divorced their spouse. You can marry them. I just don't want to be the one who performs that way. Now listen, listen carefully. The question asked in verse 3 
was answered by Jesus three different ways. You won't hear this very often, and you haven't heard it very often. He first answered it by the patriarchal law. He said, from the beginning it was not so. Nope, he won't let you divorce it forever called under the patriarchal law. Then they said, Moses did it, why, don't, why can't we do it? Well, Moses because the heart of your heart. Now he answered it a second time. He told them how Moses allowed him. And then he answered it the third time and said, but I say unto you, here's how it's going to be. Under my law, this is how it's going to be, except for fornication. The question asked in verse 3 was answered by Jesus under the patriarchal law, the Mosaic law, and the Christian law. End of story? Oh, not hardly. The disciples were worked up. They were hearing something brand new. They had not heard it before, and they were a little bit hyped. You remember Mark 10? It said, in the house, the disciples asked again of the same matter. That's why they were hyped up. And here's why. They said, Lord, let me, let, me, let me read it to you. I can read it better than I can paraphrase it. Stay with me, Matthew 19. We're going to read 10, 11, and 12. This is trying to calm down the disciples who was getting all hyped up. Okay. His disciples said unto him, so there it is. We, we're not guessing whether the disciples, it said it was his disciples. His disciples said unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. Lord, I'll tell you like it is. If what you're saying is the way it's going to be, it's better that we don't even marry her. If I can't divorce her for every cause like we've always done, and you're telling me one cause and one cause only, it's just better not to marry. And where they worked up, you better believe it, they were worked up. They had heard something brand new. I'll tell you something. If that is what they had been hearing for all this time, they wouldn't bother them at all. They'd have been used to it. They'd have been accustomed to it. But guess what? It was something brand spanking new. Well, Alan has given us his personal biblical view on Matthew 19, and I intend to give my uh, personal biblical view and my historical view. I don't uh, think Alan's personal biblical view is historically correct. As we've already seen, a, a Jewish debate was raging between uh, two notable schools of thought on this subject. Uh, there was the liberal school of Hillel, which is probably the most popular, and the conservative school of Shimei, which was probably a lot less popular. I believe the uh, Pharisees wanted to get Jesus embroiled in their Jewish debate. Therefore, they asked him a three-pronged question. Instead of the three answers that Alan claims Jesus gave to the Pharisees, one for each dispensation of time, I want to notice the three prongs or the three important clauses of their question, which provided powerful constraints for Jesus' answer. I'm not like Alan. I don't believe Jesus went off into Never Never Land and gave them a Christian answer to a Jewish debate. Therefore, let's notice this three-part question in Matthew 19 and 3. The uh, first constraint we notice in Matthew 19 and 3 is, was it lawful? Uh, they were just concerned about their law, the law of Moses. They weren't concerned about some other law, as Romans 4 and 15 says, where there is no law there is no transgression. The second prong is for a man to put away his wife. A woman couldn't put away her husband under the law of Moses, as we've already seen by viewing the concept of agona. And therefore, uh, they were uh, worried about what a man could do to his wife. And the third prong is for every cause. As we have seen, there were two schools of thought that were important. There was Hillel, the no-fault divorce school of thought, which uh, Alan believes Jesus aligned himself with. And there was the school of Shimei, which uh, only thought that a man could get a divorce for unchastity. Alan asserts that uh, 
Jesus basically agrees with Hillel, who agreed with Moses that uh, there were all kinds of allowances for divorce because of the hardness of their hearts, period. So Jesus finished his answer to the Jews with a simple acknowledgement that Hillel was right. Divorce was for every cause. But Jesus did not acknowledge that Hillel was right. In fact, Jesus continued with a conjunction, and I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So Jesus qualified their unqualified idea about divorce. Divorce was not for every cause. It was for fornication. Alan then asserts the disciples were disappointed with this qualified answer, which they had never heard before. But what about the school of Shimei? They had qualified the reason for divorce in Deuteronomy 24 and 1. Jesus' answer was not new, like Alan says it was. Alan has simply ignored some very well-known history. More likely, the disciples were disappointed because Jesus gave them a narrow or a conservative answer. I want to notice two things about the disciples' reply to Jesus. First, they use language like this, if the case of a man be so with his wife. Notice they said nothing about the case of a woman being so with her husband because they understood that a Jewish man could divorce his wife and probably they thought for any reason. Second, Jesus' answer in Matthew 19 and 9 was bound upon them immediately. Jesus didn't give his gospel then and bind it later. No, he bound it upon them right then and there and they understood that. Because they said, if the case of the man be so, and it was so, at the time Jesus gave his interpretation about Deuteronomy 24 and 1. Uh, let me finish with this statement. I, I know my viewpoint is not to be all and the end all to this Jewish debate. Uh, this debate has been going on for some 2,000 years and if this world stands and the faith in Jesus stands, uh, men and women are likely to be debating this for another 2,000 years. But I hope Alan, for his sake and the sake of the church, will simply drop this Jewish debate. Thank you.